Good morning, everybody, and welcome. My name's Nick Thurlbeck, and I'm the Chair of Commerce Ballarat. Thank you for joining us this morning. Firstly, I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wathorong people. I pay my respects to elders, past, present, and emerging. Before I introduce our speaker today, can I welcome our presenters? Tim Pallas, MP, Treasurer of Victoria. Stuart Benjamin, Chair of Regional Development Australia, Grampians Region and Small Business Ministerial Council. Thank you both for joining us. At this point, I would like to encourage those participating today to begin thinking about any questions you might have for Treasurer Pallas. You'll be able to post those questions through the Q&A um, that you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I would also like to welcome Michaela Settle, MP, member for Buninyong, Councillor Ben Taylor, Mayor of Ballarat, Councillor Jim Rinaldi, City of Ballarat, Councillor Daniel Maloney, City of Ballarat, Councillor Samantha McIntosh, City of Ballarat, Councillor Belinda Coates, City of Ballarat, and Michael Poulton, CEO, Committee for Ballarat who are all joining us online this morning. And of course, I'd also like to thank our BizNet sponsors, Adroit Assurance and Risk, BJT Legal, People at Work, Findex, Radio Ballarat, and the support, of course, from the City of Ballarat. Now it's time to introduce our speakers. Welcome to Stuart Benjamin, Chair of Regional Development Australia, Grampians Region, and Chair of the Small Business Ministerial Council who will be conducting the discussion today. Welcome also to Tim Pallas, MP, Treasurer of Victoria, Minister for Economic Development, Minister for Industrial Relations, and Minister for the Coordination of Treasury and Finance, COVID-19. Tim has played a significant role in the delivery of the $1.7 billion economic survival package and the $2.7 billion building works package that are designed to support Victorian businesses, households and workers to get through to the other side of the coronavirus crisis. I'm going to pass over now to Stuart and Tim and please everyone keep those questions coming through. Have a great morning and enjoy the time with our speakers. Well good morning, uh, good morning Nick and uh, to everybody online. It's a, a pleasure to be here uh, with BizNet uh, today and uh, uh, I'll also reiterate uh, those acknowledgements and uh, uh, it's I guess uh, terrific to be able to have the Treasurer of the State of Victoria joining us today just as he turns his camera and his mic on. Um, probably I guess it's a bit like when you're a kid growing up you never think of uh, kicking a goal in the grand final when, uh, when your team's 60 points up you always want to be that person that's kicking the goal when you're five points down. And uh, Treasurer, Tim, I wonder if, uh, is that how you feel at the moment? Uh, did you dream of being Treasurer? And is this the, uh, I guess, the, the, the crisis that you were built for? Well, I don't think anybody ever actually aspires, Stuart, to uh, want to lead in uh, circumstances like this and to be part of a team that I think is committed, working hard. I've never seen government moves so fast and I've never seen not only the pace of government but the uh, commitment from everybody involved. Uh, the sense of a shared destiny and responsibility is pretty profound. Um, I've got to say I think I had a pretty uh, good run. Uh, four, uh, five years of uh, uh, the biggest surpluses and the some of the lowest debt the state's ever seen. So as an economy we've we've uh, set ourselves up to be in as strong a position as we can to weather this economic event and believe me it's profound but no I never anticipated that I would be in this situation I suppose many of us never really saw 2020 years playing out the way that it has um, but I suppose we we all have to demonstrate uh, our level of uh, fortitude in circumstances such as this and not only that but our willingness to pay back to the community the great opportunities that it's given us in order that we can set up future generations that they can have 
the same sort of opportunities that we have. So you're you're at home today. Um, how's your your family? You're married. You've got a couple of older kids. How are you all coping with not only being at home but with just the crisis in general? Oh well, look, I think I'm coping very well. The only problem is I'm not so sure how my fellow residents are going. Um, uh, having having dad at home all the time is uh, a whole that would be new... unusual. That's very unusual for them, I'm sure. Absolutely, a lot of politicians say that when they leave the job that they want to spend more time at home with the family. My family's had a meeting and decided I should spend <laughs> time at work. Um, but uh, look, it it is a whole new set of skills that we've got to learn. Um, uh, my wife's a flight attendant with Qantas, so she's uh, uh, been stood down. My son is working. Uh, uh, in, as an IT guy uh, out of our uh, dining room, uh, giving me uh, a lot of assistance from time to time, probably more than he'd like, or indeed his employer would like. Um, but uh, certainly uh, we're, we're all getting through and my daughter's a university student and she's um, often uh, learning remotely. But how are you coping? Look, I'm, I'm doing okay. I, I've got to say, I think uh, like these are, uh, events where we all have to acknowledge that they are profoundly challenging um, and we have to uh, at least be conscious of the fact that uh, we're here for each other. This uh, trite line that we uh, we hear bandied out a lot that we're all in this together is vitally important because uh, the worst thing that can happen as we apply social is isolation principles is that we forget that we are all working towards uh, the, a common good and importantly that by all being in this together uh, we uh, can demonstrate in many ways that uh, the challenges for us are, are about uh, not only facing the external demons, the economic demons that are presenting themselves, the health problems that confront our community, but the real challenge is to understand that that battle is fought in our households, in our communities and in ourselves in many ways. So before your responsibilities as, as treasurer and your other ministerial roles, you are the member for Werribee. So how, 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 do, you, how do you play that in terms of that responsibility uh, and your broader re responsibilities to the Victoria community? Well, it's, uh, it, it's been quite interesting uh, recently because a lot of the uh, interaction with my electorate, with my community has been um, virtual in many ways. So, um, uh, I'll still have, whether it's phone calls or uh, video links with uh, community groups, uh, my electorate office, uh, who uh, have been able to keep at least the skeleton staff operating from time to time out of that office to deal with community concerns. Um, and uh, importantly, it, it's, it's necessary to visit workplaces to, to demonstrate that the government, the work of government is going on, whether it's the road construction that we're seeing happening everywhere in Wyndham at the moment because of the population growth we're dealing with uh, and all the associated congestion that flows from that, or whether it's the building of the uh, uh, juvenile uh, detention facility in Cherry Creek and visiting that, as I will be uh, uh, later this week with our Corrections Minister, Nat Natalie Hutchins, to see what progress has been made in respect of that. It's demonstrating that the work of government goes on, but it's making sure that the community gets the support and assistance that it needs in this difficult time. So how do you find, or I'm interested to know how you operate with, with the federal government. So um, a lot of the, the broader stimulus packages have, have obviously come from the Commonwealth as, as they should. Um, and I'll get on to JobKeeper and asking you your thoughts on that in a little while, but how, how do you actually operate as, as Treasurer of Victoria with, with the Commonwealth? Look, I think um, it, this event has given us an opportunity really to recalibrate the way politics operates. And for those of us who've been in this game for a long time, and believe me, I've been in this game for a long time now, I think uh, as an advisor and as a minister closing in on uh, over 20 years now, um, we sometimes become too consumed by the contest without recognising that the contest is there to improve performance, just like competition improves performance in business and in our society more generally. But competition can't be an end in itself. So the competition of ideas aimed towards getting to better policy outcomes, vitally important. 
what we are seeing now is a level of cooperation between the federal government and the state, this state, and might I say all other states, uh, that is quite remarkable. Um, and uh, I think it started about a year and a half ago, might I say, with the establishment of a, a little known institution called the Board of Treasurers, of which I'm the chair, which is all the states and territories treasurers coming together and recognising that we don't have to compete with each other. Uh, what we can do is often share learnings about better and more efficient administration, good policy ideas. It's amazing. I, we get on so well with each other that we can uh, talk quite directly uh, uh, about the ideas, the plans, the thinking that we have, and we can sound it out on each other and see if we've got common cause and want to pursue those issues together. So demonstrating that states aren't in the business of necessarily competing with each other, that political parties have more to do than simply um, uh, have the political contest, that we ultimately all have a responsibility to our constituencies and our communities, I think has been one of the profound benefits. I found working with the federal government, particularly over the last few months, uh, a lot more uh, gratifying, a lot more substantive in terms of the engagement than uh, I'd ever hoped was possible. So I hope it continues. So those relationships with other state governments uh, are always important, but now that the border, uh, we're going to have the border closed with uh, obviously South Australia already and, and now with, with New South Wales, how, 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 do, how do those discussions occur in government with uh, the impact of that on, on your area um, as that rolls into play? Well, Stuart, I think the, uh, the decision to close uh, the borders from uh, both South Australia and New South Wales ultimately was a necessary and rational one. Um, I think it does demonstrate okay. that uh, we do have uh, a situation uh, that requires us to demonstrate that we can contain this outbreak. I might make the point that National Cabinet did decide that the aim was not to eliminate the virus, um, but rather to uh, seek to manage its presentation, to track and trace and to suppress uh, its presence when it uh, arose. So uh, essentially, if some states may well have fallen into uh, an eradication strategy, but um, we're in a, a different position uh, and we're going to have to deal with that. Um, we're also going to have to make sure that uh, we don't uh, uh, cause greater difficulties to other states, other areas uh, of a problem that is uh, quintessentially uh, uh, a Melbourneian problem at the moment. So obviously we're, we're based in Ballarat, so the, uh, the second home of the Bulldogs, and I know you're a, you're a, you're a fan and I, I believe a member, um, in this, uh, this period of us all working together with other states, uh, how do we respond to uh, Premier Palaszczuk's comment that Queensland is now the home of AFL? Oh, look, I suppose we have to accept the reality that uh, even my beloved Bulldogs have, uh, have had their uh, move home. Um, uh, they, uh, they might have, have temporarily moved, but I think their heart remains with the uh, west of Melbourne and uh, might I say Ballarat as well, Stuart. Um, and we might not get to see them uh, any any time soon, but I think we get a lot of time to gloat about their success, the way things are going. Um, look, uh, I think there will be uh, an opportunity for other states to sort of uh, uh, demonstrate the differential circumstances that our jurisdictions are facing, and particularly that Victoria at the moment is doing it tough. Mm. Uh, I think... Uh, it's important that as Australians, we recognise that um, uh, we band together to help each other. I've collectively, uh, we've collectively as a state recognised uh, the issues and the problems that we're confronting, which are separate, different, and might I say, more concerning than the problems that are currently confronting other jurisdictions. But remember, this virus will be with us for a long time. There is no vaccine and its uh, presentation and representation is likely to occur across jurisdictions for quite some time to come until that vaccine occurs. So uh, I uh, recognise that there might be an opportunity to, to take some wry satisfaction out of what's going on here, but let's understand this is life and death struggle for a lot of people and there's a lot of trauma, particularly in those areas that are being currently locked down, those 
public housing facilities. Uh, and uh, the risk, we're seeing a, a spike in our hospital presentations. Yesterday, we saw two further deaths as a consequence of COVID-19 in this state. So this is uh, probably not one of those things where people can allow themselves a gratuity uh, of smugness. The, we saw the, the deeply personal response from, uh, from Richard Wynne. Uh, in terms of his connection, long-standing connection with uh, some of those towers in Melbourne. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was quite profound. So I, I, I couldn't agree with your comments more. Just back on the football, the, what's the government's position on the AFL public holiday? Is it still that we, we leave that float until we know where that may stand? Yeah, I think the, uh, uh, I, I may have um, um, misspoken on this at uh, a press conference we did some time ago. Um, uh, as I understand it, the, uh, the uh, uh, intention is that the government will um, uh, yet make a, a decision about uh, timing and uh, of, of the uh, grand final holiday. Um, yep. The intention is that there will be one, of course. And hopefully with the Bulldogs participating in it. Um, wasn't that long ago, you've, uh, you've had a bit of a connection with the Boeing plant in, in Melbourne. It wasn't that long ago, I think, that we had the Thousand uh, Dreamliner and, and obviously the Victorian connection to that. That's obviously an industry that's going to be heavily hit by, uh, by whatever this new future looks like. What are, what are some of the things that you're thinking about uh, or, or sectors of the economy that you think are going to need a little bit more support than others? Well, I think uh, the... Uh, uh, having looked at Boeing, uh, there's, uh, uh, it's quite a diverse undertaking down in, um, in Port Melbourne and I think um, certainly the uh, capacity to, to provide material for the building of uh, commercial airlines will be an issue, but they do have substantial connections uh, uh, around defence provision um, okay. and uh, hopefully, given the Commonwealth's uh, statement of $270 billion over the next 10 years uh, being put into uh, defence materials, uh, there may be an opportunity for them there. So uh, in the broader sense, uh, uh, there is no doubt that the industries that have been hit hard are those in our tourism and hospitality areas. Um, uh, uh, and of course, uh, our retail sector more generally. Um, we expect uh, when uh, we get to a point that lockdown arrangements and social distancing arrangements are relaxed, um, might I say, so far as Melbourne is concerned, it's looking that that might be some time off, um, uh, that, that that sector will bounce back relatively quickly. Um, uh, nonetheless, we've seen that there's been a profound impact upon jobs right across the Victorian economy. Um, our uh, and what you tend to see with events of this nature, and there's not a lot of historical precinct for this, but going back uh, 100 years, what we do find is that the drop off in employment happens very quickly, um, uh, whether it was the Great Depression or indeed even the GFC. You see those employment drops happen quickly, but the reinstitution of employment tends to take longer. So it's more, it's not a V-shaped recovery so much as a tick-shaped recovery, a, a rapid decline and a much more uh, long-tail recovery. So we'd anticipate three to four years of recovery uh, before we get back to the size of an economy that we were projecting only 12 months ago. So uh, that, that will be a long run event. And of course, the associated support that we've had to give to the Victorian economy uh, to assist it uh, on top of the support that the Commonwealth has given, which is greatly appreciated. Uh, uh, we've seen billions of dollars put into uh, not only support for the community, but also support for business. Uh, and that is vitally important in the long run, so far as the government is concerned, because it helps people make it through to the other side of this event. Um, but we won't necessarily get to a point where um, we can say with any great certainty that uh, every business will make it through. Uh, they won't. Um, the world is going to be different uh, from the world uh, that we saw at the start of this event. There will be many learnings uh, about uh, social connectedness, uh, about how we more efficiently uh, operate and utilise our transport systems. Uh, there'll be many uh, learnings about digital connectedness. 
Uh, and importantly, I think uh, an effort, uh, a recognition that government will have to play a much bigger role in the way that the economy operates for at least some time to come. The, uh, I have a business that's exposed to, to the tourism sector and been involved in tourism for a long time. And uh, we've certainly seen in this part of the world, our, our tourism numbers uh, have been declining uh, over, the, over the last couple of years uh, from, a, uh, uh, from an economic impact uh, point of view. And then of course, we, we get hit with uh, this, this COVID crisis. Is there any appetite within the government to, given that regional Victoria and much of regional Victoria uh, haven't had uh, cases for a long time, is there any appetite to look at a, a differential uh, lockdown rules? Well, I think there's a recognition that there is a different differential presentation of the problem. But let's not forget some 241 regional Victorians uh, have had coronavirus and our case numbers are higher than they've been in more than two months. Uh, so to keep slowing the spread of the virus, the Chief Health Officer's advice is to delay uh, an increase to gathering limits in businesses and community facilities. Let's not forget that uh, this virus started uh, with the infection of one person um, and that that uh, has subsequently led to you know, profound impact upon the world. I think we're now over 10 million infections worldwide. Um, where we would expect, of course, to see, uh, as I say, a continued representations of this virus until a vaccine is found. Uh, but to the extent that uh, we can recognise the differential uh, impact of the virus, its presence in the community, I think uh, uh, we will have to monitor its, uh, its uh, presence in the community and we'll have to make differential decisions. Uh, we've already done that. Uh, you've seen that through the uh, decisions to apply uh, postcode uh, uh, social distancing lockdowns compared to uh, a broad scale uh, impact. We're monitoring the effectiveness of that and we'll have uh, more to say about that in the near future. But I think it is clear to say that the presence of the disease in regional Victoria is not as profound as, uh, as we're seeing anywhere else. And I think that probably will require some recognition from government. The, I guess that one of the big concerns has been the drop off uh, in businesses that have had to drop off uh, apprentices. Uh, in the construction sector that, that, that I operate in, uh, we, we haven't seen that. Um, and uh, I'll talk about the, the building boost and first home owners shortly, but uh, getting feedback that in, in sectors such as automotive um, and manufacturing that uh, large numbers of apprentices have been uh, have been returned to their group training organisations. I, I see yesterday or overnight, Minister Tierney's uh, announced uh, a very large package, which I'm sure you're aware of, in terms of uh, subsidies for retraining. Um, I'm just interested in, in, in how you think we can uh, try and protect that, that kind of generation of apprentices. Yes, look, this is one of the areas that I think probably highlights the nature of um, uh, this event more than any others in the sense that it is uh, having an impact on intergenerational opportunity. As you'd appreciate, the fact that we're making decisions uh, that uh, increase the uh, debt profile of the state, uh, that put the state into deficit, therefore uh, restrict our capacity uh, for uh, greater expenditure. The fact that our unemployment rate is likely to peak as high as 11% or that 270,000 Victorians uh, could lose their jobs over the next six months and we see our economy uh, uh, decline by 14%. All that means is that, we'll, uh, that this event will translate into there being a profound impact upon the well-being of Victorians. And uh, the government's job is really to uh, seek to at least smooth some of those uh, uh, um, opportunities having been lost, particularly for young people particularly for women uh, and particularly for the less lesser skilled. And the reason being, they will be the areas of the economy that will be most adversely affected. So I suppose um, uh, the key uh, to these arrangements is to see what we can do to facilitate the uh, incentives upon business to continue to employ, uh, whether it's, uh, of course, the, the government's efforts uh, around 
economic stimulus, uh, and I'll leave it, Stuart, for you to come to that specifically, but it's also about recognising that uh, we can do more around retraining and reskilling the population. And of course, uh, Minister Tierney's uh, um, uh, indicated a continuing commitment to uh, our efforts with regard to uh, skilling the workforce, uh, assisting those uh, uh, trainees and apprentices who are encountering difficulties in terms of con continuity of their employment. That's going to be important. We, we are seeing that uh, these workers are the first adversely affected, that many businesses don't have a choice and they have to lay off those workers. And that's a intergenerational problem because if people give up on their training and their skilling, uh, then it's the community as a whole that is the poorer for it. So uh, many of us in business that have been supported by the JobKeeper program are obviously looking at the end of September now with, I guess, more trepidation than we probably were 10 days or two weeks ago, because we thought we could see um, a, a path out of, out of this that is a little bit, little bit more murky uh, now. So in terms of that economic uh, stimulus um, to, I guess, give, give, it, give us hope that the economy is going to uh, grow back into 2021, um, where, do, where do you sit on what advice you'd be providing to the Commonwealth on uh, either the extension or the, uh, I guess, the, the word of 2020, the pivot of, the, uh, uh, of, that, of that program? Well, we've been pretty uh, consistently clear that um, it would be um, massively disadvantageous to uh, the recovery were we to essentially get to a position at the end of September where a uh, job keeper was to uh, essentially just uh, disappear. Uh, I think that will have a profound effect upon the economy. Um, it's done a, a, a fantastic job in many ways. It's uh, uh, at a, added a very profound impact upon the, the capacity of businesses to keep people in work. So uh, it just uh, turning off, I think, would have a profound adverse effect upon the national economy. Uh, and I think that's generally the view of most economists. And, and quite frankly, I think um, uh, certainly our efforts have been to the Commonwealth to that they need to think about what uh, measures they can keep in place post uh, the uh, apprehended uh, timelines for um, stopping the JobKeeper payments. Uh, I think they're turning their mind to it, whether or not they're tailoring it, whether they're uh, making it industry specific, uh, or whether they're winding back the, the, the level of support, I don't know. But uh, to simply go uh, uh, cold turkey, as it were, without uh, mm. a, a, a tapering of these payments, I think will have a profound adverse effect upon industry. Uh, you know, from our point of view, we put in $2.7 billion for the building works package for shovel ready projects across the state, we put in $1.7 billion for an economic survival package, including payroll tax relief, put in 491, so almost half a billion dollars for tax relief to exempt JobKeeper payments from payroll tax and work covenant. Mm -hmm. And we put in half a billion dollars for commercial and residential tenancy packages to help people make that bridge through the uh, rental crisis uh, and the fact that a lot of uh, businesses don't have the funds to actually meet rent. So. Um, it, it's a recognition that what we do has to complement each other's efforts. Uh, I'm not going to be critical of the Commonwealth um, in the current environment. I think uh, uh, the, the fact that they've uh, been prepared to work as cooperatively uh, to make choices that I suppose in the normal course of events wouldn't sit entirely comfortable with their ideological uh, predisposition, that's a good thing. Uh, we all have to shed ourselves of so, sort of our ideological ballast in circumstances where the community expects governments to do more. Uh, and my very strong uh, advice to the Commonwealth is and remains that they have to find a way to make that bridge from uh, JobKeeper as it exists at the moment to what level of support and assistance specific industries and uh, specific businesses and employees will need going forward. Otherwise, we will see a very substantial peak in um, uh, the uh, labour market in terms of mm. that uh, I, I think has the risk to put us into 
a, a double dip uh, situation where the recovery embryonic as it, as it is um, uh, will be at risk. Uh, I'd like to, in a moment, I'll move into a uh, question. So I'll just invite anyone on the call to uh, just use the Q&A link to, uh, to send through some questions. But um, one of those big economic stimulus programs was an existing one that uh, uh, for those of us in, 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 in building and construction, we were worried what was going to have to uh, happen with the first home owners grant uh, support in Victoria. You came out very early to announce that that program would continue. And of course, now combined with the building boost, uh, we've seen particularly in growing areas like uh, like Ballarat, one of the fastest growing regional locations in the country. Um, we're running out of land, which is uh, kind of a, uh, an interesting problem to have. Um, how do you make decisions about that that allocation of budget? Because that's a uh, that's I'm not sure how much the first homeowner grant uh, impact was on the on the state budget, but that was a fairly big call that you would have had to fight to keep that money in cabinet. I would have imagined. Oh, not really. I mean, I think there's a general recognition um, uh, in both the cabinet and the caucus that rural and regional Victoria are vitally important to the long term economic vitality of the state, but also uh, critically important uh, that if uh, we want to uh, grow our regions, then um, uh, an, an effort to keep uh, or to make it attractive for people, particularly young people uh, with skills, starting out a family, need that opportunity. So our, our strategy for the regions, and if I could use Ballarat as a specific example, is to not only support the growth in the domestic economy, but also to support people whose choice is to move to the area. So um, uh, our economic support package, 368 businesses in the Ballarat region have already received payroll tax refunds, which um, uh, total almost $6 million in cash back in their bank accounts. A total of 2,203 businesses have been paid a one-off $10,000 business support fund grant. In the Ballarat region, we've got uh, the uh, $2.7 billion building works fund has translated into $15 million more for the Miners Rest Primary School upgrades, $10 million for the Phoenix Peter 12 Community College upgrades. Um, we're seeing um, uh, resurfacing work on the Ballarat uh, Dalesford Road, the removal of waste and graffiti along the Ballarat line, fencing along the Ballarat line, rail maintenance for Ballarat to Ararat and Deer Park to Ballarat, and upgrading security and improved design at the Ballarat Health Services Acute Adult Unit. So, uh, you did mention, Stuart, that we've extended the first homeowner grant of $20,000 for regional Victorians to the middle of next year. And in the city of Ballarat, that means 958 first homeowner grants uh, have been provided since the 1st of July 2017. On the issue of re regional payroll tax, currently half the metro rate, and we're cutting it further to a quarter of the metro rate in 2022-23. Last financial year, we estimated that the businesses in the city of Ballarat are going to save uh, uh, $15 million, some 422 businesses. So there's a lot of things going on, both in terms of the support that the government can give to business, uh, but also when we can make specific interventions for the purposes of capital works, whether it's the support for our rolling stock and Alstrom, uh, or indeed, you know, the uh, the ten million up dollars upgrade to stage three of the uh, of Her Majesty's Theatre, a lot of work going on, and it's all aimed at recognising that this is uh, about giving every Victorian, regardless of where they live, the opportunity to uh, achieve their full potential, and to recognise uh, that uh, this is not a government for Melbourne; it's a government for all Victorians. And we're very pleased uh, to hear this morning uh, Radio Ballarat have been following through a story. There's been some concern in the community here that maybe our, our large hospital upgrade at Ballarat Health Services might have been delayed or, or, or even put off. So we were pleased to hear um, this morning that Minister Makarkos has, uh, has confirmed that that project is on track and I think uh, going to be completed in, in 2026. So that's a, you know, that's a half a billion dollar project. So we're, uh, we're pretty excited about that. Um, Minister, if I had to ask you uh, what you thought the first question would be, I suspect you would know that it was about payroll tax. You've already talked quite a lot about payroll tax, but whenever we speak uh, 
speak with you. That's that's always the first question. So uh, no payroll tax on JobKeeper. Obviously, the uh, the refunds that you've talked about have already started to flow back into into Ballarat businesses. Um, I think almost every budget that you have presided over, there's been a payroll tax decrease. Um, that's obviously a, a philosophy that you've you've held firm to. Very much so. I mean, my view has always been that to the extent that we can um, uh, more efficiently deliver the services of government, Stuart, then that's vitally important. Um, if you think about that, it's not just the 368 businesses who are getting direct support from the government at the moment through our payroll tax refunds or indeed the half a billion dollars worth of tax relief uh, to complement the Commonwealth's JobKeeper payments by removing payroll tax and work cover premiums uh, from those payments. One of the things I've tried to do uh, uh, in terms of what we're, what we're uh, seeking to assist business with is to reduce the burden of employment um, and, and also to make sure that government recognises that uh, yes, taxes are an inevitable part of the delivery of services and state governments more than uh, any other tier of government is uh, directly delivering services into communities, whether it be your health system, uh, your, your school and education system, whether it be the police and emergency services or indeed the regulation and oversight uh, of our uh, vital utilities. All of this really means that uh, ultimately we have to have a revenue base to be able to manage it, but that's not an excuse for government trying to be as efficient as we can so that we can apply our effort and our endeavour to assist business when they need it. So our business support fund grants, for example, um, right across Victoria, almost 75,000 businesses have received uh, 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 payments uh, totaling some $742 million since the 21st of March this year. Um, in the Ballarat region, of course, uh, 2,203 businesses have been paid that one-off $10,000 business support fund grant. That's all good, but of course, at the end of the day, you need to factor in to your business model exactly what the charging that the state intends put, putting in place. That's why we've uh, consistently not only identified reductions in payroll tax, but we've plotted out the direction and the long-term effort that the government intends putting in this space to progressively reduce payroll tax, particularly in regional Victoria, so that ultimately it will be 25% of uh, the metropolitan rate, which gives you a massive competitive advantage and makes regional Victoria so much more attractive for people to come and live and work in. So I guess we've all learnt uh, today about the Board of Treasurers, which was something I didn't know existed uh, until you mentioned it. We've got a question from Andrew Boatman who asks, how do, how do you use that platform to, to try and get away from the bidding wars that we see between states for either events or, or uh, corporate relocations? I guess the example that Andrew raises is the, uh, the location of Virgin, although I suspect that was never, never really going to, going to leave Queensland. Um, is, is that a platform where those kind of things can be discussed or is that competition just a natural part of a federation? Well, uh, firstly, I'd say, Stuart, that I don't think um, that competitive federalism is a bad thing. Um, uh, the, the fact that um, you know, the state of Victoria comes up with an idea um, and other states copy it uh, or seek to improve on it, that's a good thing. Uh, classic illustration. It was the state of Victoria that decided to remove uh, uh, stamp duty for first homeowners uh, purchasing properties under $700,000, $750,000. Um, and uh, what we saw was uh, essentially every other jurisdiction uh, uh, look at it and seek to apply similar sort of arrangements. Um, uh, we've seen uh, an increasing level of interest around the charging regimes that the state's put in place, the foreign purchaser surcharging arrangements that Victoria instituted, and now every other state has copied. That's not a bad thing, but it's uh, also a, a question of making sure that competitive federalism doesn't turn into destructive federalism. Um, I've all, always taken the view that um, um, to attract uh, foreign direct investment to Victoria, we've got to be able to work hard to demonstrate the fundamental 
attractiveness of doing business in this state. As the Minister for Economic Development, can I tell you about three quarters uh, to 80% of all the foreign and interstate businesses that set up in Victoria uh, do it because uh, they see it as a better place to do business and don't receive any financial support from the state whatsoever to do that. There are occasions when the relocation of businesses uh, or uh, the need to compete against other jurisdictions uh, has led to uh, payments for those companies for the relocation costs principally, but uh, they tend to be more the exception than the rule. And ultimately, if we don't have a good product to sell, um, people aren't gonna come here. And if the thing that motivates them is what the cash incentive to be here uh, is, then they won't last long either, because if they're up to be uh, uh, purchased for the pur purposes of moving, then they'll do it again um, in the not too distant future. So my aim has been to form uh, partnerships with businesses that see the intrinsic value of um, moving their activities, their efforts, or indeed growing their businesses. Um, so competitive federalism is good when it means that we all improve our performance and learn from each other. Um, but it's bad if it's essentially uh, just basically uh, competing with taxpayer dollars for no uh, obvious benefit to the state. Moving, uh, moving businesses to Victoria uh, is, is great, but obviously our interest is relocating them to, uh, to, to regional Victoria. We've got a number of questions talking about um, uh, support for that. And I think you've answered that. The last thing you want to do is provide financial support because... Uh, uh, that subsidises it because once that ends, uh, uh, potentially they leave. Um, we've had a terrific economic impact from the GovHub project uh, here here in Ballarat, and we're looking forward to those uh, those those thousand people being based uh, in our CBD. We've got some questions just about future future industries. So there are many of us that that hope that this. We can get some benefit out of this crisis and maybe, uh, I guess, restructure our economy, in particular our regional economy. So given your former job as or your ministerial role as the resources minister, uh, I think a lot of Ballarat people wouldn't be aware of some of the opportunities that exist in the mineral sector in, in Western Victoria. And um, I wonder whether you might talk about that and then maybe also the opportunities for renewables given that we're also the most energy, renewable energy dense uh, location in, in Australia? Well, I think, um, uh, thanks Stuart, the, the real challenge for us is to recognise that um, uh, there is uh, an enormous spread of opportunity for regional Victoria and uh, we've got a great product to sell to the world, whether it's, uh, of course, our valued added agricultural products, or to recognise that we're a lot more um, substantial than just a one-trick pony on uh, the agricultural side. Um, what we're doing, for example, in the resources sector is nothing short of uh, amazing. We are seeing um, Victoria, for example, experiencing a gold rush. We've seen the gold price uh, jump over 15% since, uh, mm. well, used to royalty in January 2020. Where the, uh, uh, we, we are seeing the level of investment in resourcing uh, uh, going through the roof and in no small part due to the exploratory efforts that are going on around the Stavely Arc, but uh, also the extra fines that we're um, demonstrating in um, a number of our uh, key gold areas, but uh, uh, Bendigo being one of them uh, at the moment. What, what I think is important is to recognise that government has to be a facilitator of uh, opportunities and ideas. And when it comes to uh, regional Victoria have a massive uh, advantage uh, when it comes to renewable energy um, and uh, whether it's uh, the provision for wind farms, solar farms or indeed might I say the manufacturing of some of those materials yeah. as we've seen with Vestas down in Portland and, and uh, the key for us is to recognise that um, we have to use our opportunity to demonstrate the way through uh, our low carbon emission future and what we're going to do to get there. Uh, so the stuff that the Minister for Energy has uh, been advocating for and delivering on, uh, things like a renewable energy target uh, that has got us to a position where 
uh, we've seen a lot of confidence and investment, particularly in regional Victoria and particularly in the Western regions of uh, Victoria, has demonstrated that we've really set this area up as a, a centre of excellence uh, and uh, capacity going forward. I think that there are enormous uh, opportunities, both in resources, agriculture, renewable energies for the region. Uh, and importantly, I think those challenges can only be facilitated by uh, the efforts of government recognising that uh, we've got to make appropriate interventions. And uh, the renewable energy target, I think, is a clear demonstration of uh, how that can be done. Setting uh, reasonable and appropriate emissions targets uh, that uh, demonstrate that we're not going to simply um, uh, disable the capacity of our, our broader industry to operate, but recognise that we do have to make investments to get us to a low carbon emission future. Minister, thank you. We've, uh, we've run out of time. We could have talked for another hour. I'm sure you've got a, uh, a busy, busy day ahead of you. Um, can I thank you on behalf of uh, Commerce Ballarat and, and our 600 members. Uh, very much appreciate your time and we wish you uh, all power in your efforts uh, to uh, keep the Victorian economy going and, and appreciate your continued support of small business. I can also thank uh, once again our sponsors being Adroit and BJT Legal, uh, People at Work, Findex and Radio Ballarat, as well as the ongoing support of um, the City of Ballarat. And uh, on behalf of Commerce Ballarat, we'll, uh, we'll sign off and hope everybody has a terrific day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Tim.